General evacuation? I thought I'd heard it all. Optimus expects us to turn tail and retreat. Not happening. If I turn my tail, it'll be to crush another wave of Decepticons with it. Optimus may subsist on sheer determination and will alone. Great leaders draw their power from conviction. Their armies, however, march forward only under the power of Energon. This terrible war will reach its end. Not because all have finally become one, but simply, I fear, because all have become none. Battlefield Log 1186. Sideswipe transmitting for Optimus. Arc Energon fuel levels have been checked and rechecked. The situation is worse than we feared. Many were of the opinion that even before Megatron's latest offensive, Energon levels were insufficient for extended space travel. Now, after another protracted battle with the Decepticons, there is no more room for debate. At the current levels of consumption, we will not have enough Energon to even reach the Space Bridge portal safely. Fellow Autobots, Per Technological Directive 84 Beta 1, initiated by Optimus Prime, executed by myself, Perceptor, and my team, Teletran subterminals have been brought back online where possible in inhabitable facilities and structures across Cybertron. Though antiquated by standards we have come to expect, the Teletran terminals are perfectly functional and efficient, and every soldier is encouraged to check in and upgrade or repair your weapons when necessary. Arc Inspection Log 1245. Sideswipe here. Transmitting to... to... well, whoever will listen. Which at this point seems like no one. Once again, I feel compelled to record my objection to the current specifications for the Autobots Exodus craft. The so-called Arc. The prototype Vanguard-class deep space interceptor. With insufficient armor plating and only 16 particle combustion canyons and 16 laser emitters, it is apparent to myself at least, that only the craft's propulsion system is adequate to the task at hand. Clearly, the Ark is intended to simply outrun any hostile craft. Battlefield Log 4578. Leapers, there's a whole platoon of them activated. If you're listening to this, turn back and avoid engagement at all costs. These things are as savage and brutal a warrior as I've ever seen. But if you must face them, always keep moving, and try to engage them from behind. Their armored claws make a head-on attack a waste of energon. Arc Inspection Log 1313, my final entry in this record. As anyone who has listened to these updates can attest, my assessment of this so-called Arc has been far from optimistic. Though assembled by a perfectly competent team of engineers in a most efficient manner, it seemed impossible to imagine that such a humble craft would be capable of carrying the entirety of the Autobots' hopes and dreams as its cargo. Ironhide's log. Been fighting this war for so long, sometimes I forget how it started. In the early cycles, Cybertronians knew nothing but the job they were born into, the daily grind of an orderly world. Things seemed to change in the blink of an optic. We evolved as a society and free thinkers. Many of us wanted to be free to explore the cosmos. Others had more sinister designs. No Cybertronian who's seen our once great home in its current form need be reminded that our planet is powering down, that our home is dying. So I record this log not for this day and age, but for a future that may well never come to pass. But still, we must hope that one day a future generation will once again know Cybertron only in its resplendent, gleaming, metallic glory. And it is for this generation that we must chronicle the cause and consequence of our planet's decline. A young archivist named Orion Pax was the first to sense something was wrong. Working in the Hall of Records, he monitored the same transmissions as everyone else. But he heard so much more. Orion was the first to realize that the gladiator Megatronus had ambitions that far outreached his success in the pits. After being shunned by the High Council, Megatronus created a new identity, and Megatron and his Decepticons were born. Lieutenant, we're pinned down. Do not proceed to rendezvous. There's a giant...
giant marauder laying down a wall of flak. Thing won't let up. Primus! Just lost our flank support. Three more down. Let's go get these sons of rust fucking. When the Decepticons came, they came with a ferocity no one had seen before. We Autobots weren't fighters. We had no experience in war. We were ill-prepared to face Megatron's legions, gladiators who thrived on destruction and mayhem. If we had any advantage, it was the fact that we felt we were fighting for a truer cause. Freedom. Charged with being the last line of defense for Iacon, the Autobot's capital, and guarding the gateway to Cybertron's core, Omega Supreme was considered unstoppable in battle, relentless in his mission, and fearless in the face of danger. When Megatron and Omega Supreme faced off for the final time, Megatron and his Decepticons managed to open just a small chink in Omega's armored chest plate. Megatron poured dark energon through this seemingly innocuous wound. Even the greatest of warriors could not combat the terrible corruptive power of the wicked substance, and after a valiant struggle, Omega Supreme fell into stasis. A civil war spread like a storm of burning energon across the surface of Cybertron, devouring in its path the great city of Iacon. Even I was caught off guard by the depth of Megatron's depravity. I should have anticipated his utter lack of feeling for his fellow Cybertronians. But at the expense of the lives of many thousands of my fellow Autobots, I did not. Field recon transmission. I've reached the reservoir in question and sampled the liquid substance thought to be corrupted energon. In fact, initial tests are conclusive only in the negative sense. Substance in question is not dark energon. Repeat, it is not dark energon. All I can conclude at this point is that the substance appears to be some kind of byproduct created in the refinement of Energon. To what end Decepticons are refining Energon in this locale is undetermined. Never have I observed such a traumatizing sight. An entire city of rust. Everything down to the last bolt is encrusted. Severe oxidation, pitting the metal's surface, gradually deforming its shape. I fear for the health of all Autobots. The supply of energon may be on every Cybertronian's mind, but I have observed the encroaching influence and effects of rust on many Autobots. We must be ever vigilant to its presence, or this city will overtake us all. Audio logs. That's all we hear about these days. Since the General Evac order went round, all good Cybertronians are expected to record their impressions, recollections, and insights as to how we got into this calamitous mess. For the data net. For posterity? <laughs> what do I know about posterity? You want my expert opinion for your audio logs? Here it is. You see a guardian before he sees you? Put out his lights. Once he knows you're there, your grease is pretty much fried. I evaded detection longer than any other Autobot. Me, the Invisible Scout. The vents are also an excellent place to launch an ambush on the enemy. I held my own for many cycles, but Decepticons are tireless, and I, running low on Energon, was not. Time has no meaning to an Autobot in stasis. No meaning at all. Not much is known about the civilization that once spanned across what is now the Sea of Rust. Its history has been lost to time and oxidation. What is for certain is that its technology and culture predates the Civil War by a few millennia. Rumors persist, though unsubstantiated, of a massive explosion being the cause that abruptly ended all sentient life there and created the Sea of Rust. Whether this explosion was an accident of some lost technology or the result of a hostile conflict will be debated for ages to come. What an unexpected surprise. A small team of Autobots have been captured by my Insecticons. Their leader, Grimlock, is an impressive specimen indeed. I will enjoy breaking them all. I am annoyed by the perceived value of this inconsequential Energon Lake. It is but a minuscule puddle compared to what the tower next to it can truly give us.
Inferior minds like star screams have misjudged this structure as a simple energon refinery. However, my research has revealed it to be so much more. The ancients built it to tear the fabric of space and time itself and open gateways to distant galaxies high in the orbit of Cybertron. I look forward to exploring this technology. Perhaps we can find another world with resources and energy we could use to reboot Cybertron's core. <sighs> For a scientist, Shockwave sure can act like an absolute idiot sometimes. He's wasted far too much time on this defunct Energon Tower. There is a lake of high-grade Energon shimmering in front of his eyes, and all he does is mutter to himself and make countless calculations up in that blasted refinery of his. Sometimes I just want to shout, Hey, Shockwave, want to go for a swim today? Heard there's a nice, gigantic pool of Energon ten feet from where you're standing. I've had just about enough of these Insecticons. Shockwave thinks of them as his pets, and he may believe he controls them, but truth be told, they do whatever they want on the battlefield. One of those oil holes slammed right into me, about busted my armor. So let's just say, I put his assets in stasis. Shockwave should really find himself some new pets. Forward recon to base. Over. Base. I'm not sure if I've got a transmission connection or not, but in case anyone is hearing this, here's a little FYI I wish someone would have shared with me before I got into this prime forsaken place. If you come across a web of faint lasers, avoid them. They'll wreak havoc on your systems and jam your cloaking ability. Both the Autobots and the Decepticons utilize minefields to protect and defend our trade routes. So what makes this homing mine so unique? Once it locks onto your position, it is almost impossible to evade unless you destroy it with your weapon first. Running is futile, and once one homing mine locks onto your coordinates, others are certain to follow. Some argued I should have split the convoy in Energon on its journey to Autobot City. However wise, there is no time. The transport, though heavy and cumbersome, is our best hope. In the meantime, I wonder as to how the Decepticons will respond to their leader being pulverized. I sense the one called Starscream has been waiting for this opportunity. Even before Energon became so scarce, these ridiculously designed transport tankers devoured just about as much Energon as they carried. I question the use of them to transport what Energon remains from the lake, but... Orders are orders. There's been a lot of talk about victory lately. About how the Autobots are through. On their heels. Too much talk, if you ask me. When you're overconfident, you're underprepared. Just like we were when we came across an Autobot Titan this morning. Tore the whole unit into spare parts, while any damage we inflicted on the Titan was immediately repaired by his battery of helper drones. Finally, someone started blasting those things out of the air. With the drones out of the action, we were able to get good target effect with our ordnance. Onslaught, Brawl, Vortex, Swindle, and Blastoff. Each one a formidable force in his own right. Together... Talk about the whole being greater than some of its parts. When the Combaticons combine to form Bruticus, any Autobots in the vicinity are facing a whole world of hurt. Seldom have I felt more vulnerable on a mission. I think my fellow Autobots feel the same. Here we are, wheeling a slow-moving slug of a transport loaded with highly unstable, incredibly explosive energon through heavily contested territory in broad daylight. Oh, and did I forget to mention that if we do encounter Decepticon resistance and this powder keg blows, it won't just be our metallic hides that burn up in the Inferno, but the entire future of every Autobot. I can't figure out for the life of me who's the bigger idiot. The Lughead who came up with a design that exposes live ammunition rounds on the exterior of the cannon batteries, or me, for agreeing to stand out here and load the things. What's got two thumbs and no apparent capacity for intelligence? <laughs> this guy. Perimeter recon report. 
Base, this is Recon 1-1 Alpha. We're all quiet on the western front out here. No hostiles dotting these clear blue sky... Ow! Ah! Scrap! What the... Ah! I just passed in front of a vent and took a ten-foot exhaust flame right in my unmentionables! Starscream stepped in it this time. He's pressing charges against us? Like this whole thing was our fault. It's a true scientific marvel that guy can spew that much scrap without running dry. Though it might be true that we have no choice, I'm still uneasy about treating a sentient, even one as savage as Trypticon, as a repository for Energon. Trypticon, of course, took the life of many Autobots. Perhaps it is only fitting that he now gives life to so many in return. After just a very short set of cycles, what seemed like a nanoclick in comparison to the millennium of oppression endured by Cybertronians, the status quo has been destroyed. Optimus Prime and his foolish Autobots continue to resist the tide of history, toiling under the persistent delusion that they can single-handedly reverse the direction of time itself. The struggle for freedom has been won. The revolution will be permanent. After countless megacycles of war, I have faced no harder decision. Given no more difficult order than this. Effective immediately, all Autobot soldiers are to retreat their positions and gather at Iacon. A final general evacuation has been planned and it is presently underway. I implore all of you to resist, as I have resisted, the temptation to fight until the end. The end is here and now. Cybertron itself is past the point of survival. The future of the Autobots lies far from these war-torn lands. That future must begin now. I look forward to the honor of serving each of you again aboard the Ark. Until then, may the Primes watch over you. Peace will be attained through war and nothing short of it. Hearing this simple truth, so elegantly expressed, was the first time I took genuine notice of the gladiator called Megatron. Like most Decepticons, I felt an inexplicable draw to the gladiator pits even before Megatron began his steady rise to glory. We were pulled to the arena as if the violence itself were somehow beckoning us. Which, of course, it was. The High Council and even Optimus himself underestimated Megatron for this reason. They believed that he created a revolution. When the opposite was the case, the revolution created Megatron. Has Optimus witnessed firsthand the sight of Trypticon disassembled, pulled from limb to limb? His still living carcass slowly bled dry by our leeching tubes. Does war give us the right to live like parasites off our fallen enemies? I am hopeful that those wiser than me see issues such as this more clearly than I. Lab Report 1161. Experimentation continues. Effectively meshed Autobot source code with most ferocious of creatures detected on target planet. Two powerful hind legs, a heavy tail to act as a counterbalance to the longest and heaviest jaw I have seen. Splice made with Autobot soldier Grimlock. Further strength harvested by rerouting power from central intelligence processing system to legs, jaws, and arms. Advisory to all Decepticons within range of this transmission. Space bridge testing set to commence in 20 microcycles. Significant turbulence should be expected. Those with fragile fuses may wish to connect with an auxiliary ground wire to the nearest metal structure. Tower security systems. Internal security report. Field to base. Our perimeter check is complete. The tower is just about impregnable. Not surprising, given that it was Shockwave himself that established the protocols. Only vulnerability we've identified is to EMP attack. Whether time and resources permit addressing this issue remains to be decided by those who punch a pay stub bigger than mine. No one around here even bothers to question that nutjob Shockwave anymore. But this? 
why the speck did he build an exact scale replica of a space tower over in the sea of rust? Talk about a waste of energy, John. I can't even get reimbursed for my off-duty recon patrols? Please. Trypticon failed me in spectacular fashion. I considered the transgression to be unforgivable. That is, until my brilliant and compassionate intellect realized that there was in fact a penance worthy enough to compensate for Trypticon's failings. We are in need of a spacecraft large enough to transport several dozen battle groups. Trypticon is no longer in need of his body. I see an elegant calculus in the making. Shockwave, all effort must now be focused on remote extraction of the target planet's energon reserves. Your calculations inspire sufficient confidence that such a plan is not only possible, but probable. Such an influx of raw energon right here on Cybertron will not only provide sufficient power to destroy Optimus and his Autobots once and for all, but also fuel the rebirth of our great empire. This is no longer an aspiration. It must be made a reality. Lab Report 1164. With thin membranes stretched from its frail arms to its narrow torso, together with its razor-sharp jaws, the naturally occurring creature seems almost perfectly designed to bring death from above. Almost. With only minor modifications to the Autobot's swoop source code, true perfection appears attained. Shockwave's log. Inspired by my enhancements on the Autobots, I have decided to create a few upgrades for my personal arsenal. When finished, this gun could generate power to rival even Megatron. I've had just about enough of these Insecticons. Shockwave thinks of them as his pets, and he may believe he controls them, but truth be told, they do whatever they want on the battlefield. And I may have to work alongside them, but I don't like it. They're cannibalistic. One of them goes down, another will devour it. Feed on its energy. I had a friendly fire incident a couple cycles back. One of those oil holes slammed right into me, about busted my armor. So let's just say I put his assets in stasis. Shockwave should really find himself some new pets. Lab Report 1165. Its front protected by a triple spiked shield and from the rear by a spiked whip-like tail. Make for an excellent defensive design worthy of serious consideration. Steps have been taken to alter the source code of the subject slug to approximate the naturally occurring species. Lab Report 1162. Source code of Autobot Bruiser combined with a large shell-backed creature with six spiny legs. The natural curves of the creature's exoskeleton are stunning in their elegance. Together with a seemingly innate attack instinct, this hybrid species should prove formidable indeed. Lab Report 1166. A second heavily armored defense weapon might be inspired by this strangely armor-spined creature. Attempts are underway at present to fashion a true beast of burden through extensive manipulation of the Autobot Snarl's source code. Lab Report 1163. Spitter. The name says it all. The most direct and simple combination of this series of experiments. After discovering a flying, lightweight, insecticon-like creature in the wilds of the target planet, only slight source code modifications were necessary to optimize new species for combat and reconnaissance. <laughs>